Okay, so for those of you who haven't been around too much, just a few of you guys, uh, we've been working our way through book for book of Luke, a book, for nearly the last year. So we've taken a few detours along the way, a few little bits and pieces of the things we've looked at, but that's the common thread for 2017 is Luke. So I hope you're finding it helpful, those who have been here all that time, as uh, Luke shows Jesus from this, his perspective, which is the perspective of the perfect man. Because the, the four Gospels have four different perspectives, and Luke's is looking at the perfect man. But he's not just a man, of course, and we'll see a bit of that today. And I hope, I've learned heaps as I prepared these messages. And I guess the measure of a good preacher is how well he can explain what he finds as he, as he does his research and searches the scriptures, and at least that's my angle on it. Now, other churches might place prior, priorities on passion or speaking skill or personal application, but the way I describe my passion is simply to explain the Bible, and then I think everything else takes care of itself. So that way I put the onus on God to do the work. His spirit works through the words written down for us, I think. That's, that's what he tells us they do. So if I stick to them, that's the best chance of remaining inside his will. So if that's okay, I'd like to keep doing that, certainly this morning. So yes, Luke's big focus is to describe to Theophilus, if you read the first chapter, he's talking to Theophilus. He'd, um, so Luke had very carefully researched about this man Jesus. So the reason was so that Theophilus could be confident in the things that he'd been taught. That's what... Luke tells us early on. So, judging by what Luke has written to us so far, the biggest thing, or I can ask you, what is the biggest thing that Theophilus um, had to be confident in? What, what was the most important thing he was trying to tell him about? Jesus? Yeah? <laughs> well, it's, uh, that's the basis of the whole thing, is who Jesus really is. Okay, that's what we're trying to get at here. And that's the basis that that should make Theophilus satisfied with what Luke writes, is that he's showing him who Jesus really is. So it's, it's, everything is about the authenticity of a person, the character of this man, Jesus of Nazareth. So testimonies obviously help that, they shine light on that. Writings are good, they um, give us more information. But only as far as they focus on him... Jesus as the reliable and trustworthy subject. So that's the centre. That's what we're trying to get across in our first part this morning. So we can take that generally as well, that our faith, the Christian faith, is built upon the kind, sorry, built upon the person and identity of this man, Jesus of Nazareth. It's kind of like the, the capstone there of a stone doorway. Like the picture that's showing up there. I might move across to the side. I'm going to have to use my pointer in a little while. And uh, so, yeah, Jesus is like the capstone. He's the cornerstone as well, but in other pictures, he's the capstone. So, and what happens if that capstone crumbles or is removed? Collapses. The whole thing just collapses in, doesn't it? Yeah. So, that, in the same way, if Jesus is shown to fail in any way, or if, if he's proven false, then our whole system of faith fails. We might as well go home and do something else. So yeah, that's the focus of this message today. Who really is this Jesus? So, and obviously we've talked about this multiple times before because Luke, is, that's his point all the way through. But we have, I think, hope some, some special insights today in our passage. And they're new in the sense that Luke hasn't mentioned them so far. So I hope they strike you as they struck me. So identity, okay, so that's the word. So here's a little illustration about identity. Does anyone know that identity? Not many people do. Anyone into books? No? So Gustav Doré, he's a renowned artist. The story goes like this. He lost his passport while travelling in Europe. So when he came to a border crossing, he explained his predicament to one of the guards. Giving his name to the official, you know, expecting, oh, this is Doré, he'll be off. He hoped he'd be recognised and allowed to pass. The guard, however, said that many people attempted to cross the border by claiming to be persons they were not. Dore insisted that he was the man he claimed to be. All right, said the official, we'll give you a test. If you pass, pass it, we will allow you to go through. Handing him a pencil and sheet of paper, he told the artist to sketch several peasants standing nearby. 
Dore did it so quickly and skillfully that the guard was convinced he was indeed who he claimed to be. His work confirmed his word. I think the parallel is pretty clear there, that Jesus' work also confirms his word. So as like, like we've been reading over and over in the book of Luke, all the things that Jesus is doing is pointing us to who he really is. So the identity of the Lord is fixed. He's God the Messiah. He's the saviour of the world. But how do you get people to see that? You've got to do something, right? You can't just talk about it and expect people to believe you necessarily. You have to do something. So you can, like, you can go around telling people you're a surgeon all you like. And some gullible people might believe you. Until you're standing there with a scalpel you know, in, in, in your hand and in front of a patient and you have no idea what to do, then you're shown for who you really are. Right? If you're just telling people you're a surgeon and you're not, you get exposed as a fraud. So in the same way, Jesus had to do the things that only God could do if his Messiahship was to be seen. If he's Messiah, he's got to do the things the Messiah should do. And we've had more evidence of that in this passage today, in both the testimony of the disciples, specifically Peter, who had been with him for the last couple of years, and then the incredible transfiguration of Jesus. And along the way, we have some brilliant verses of scripture, uh, like memory verses and songs and that kind of thing. They're suitable for lots of things. So we'll take a look at that in a second. But first, we need to point out where this happened. So that will be relevant in a little while. Okay. So Now, the last episode, so the feeding of the 5,000 was what happened just last, we looked at last week. That happened in Bethsaida. That's down there where that arrow is. You might be able to read that, some of you. That's Bethsaida. So from the other Gospels, we find that they've gone north and they're now in the area of Caesarea Philippi, up there. That's at the foot of what's called the Golan Heights. Today they're called the Golan Heights. So they're approaching the mountains. That's why I got, tried to get a picture with a bit of you know, relief map kind of thing on there. You can see the, the height there. And I now have come to believe myself that they're there for a very specific reason and why he's taking them in that direction. But we'll talk about that in a little while. So let's look now at Luke. So if you have your Bible, go to Luke chapter 9, verse 18. We'll start there. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the crowds say I am? So here, Jesus is really starting to hone in on, on the important part of what he's trying to teach his disciples. He's had long enough with these guys now, uh, teaching them about who he is, and now he wants to get to the point. Yeah, so you've seen all the things I've been doing, now I'm going to get to the point. But he leads into that firstly by just asking you know, what the word on the street is. Verse 19. And they answered, oh sorry, not, sorry, I've gone ahead too far there. No, that's right. And they answered, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Okay, so that's, that's what everyone's talking about on the street. There's some of the rumours, and we saw Herod had been hearing these kind of things last week. He mentioned a lot of the same characters there. But people's expectations thought that's who Jesus might be. But Jesus wasn't that interested in hearsay. He was segueing here. He wanted to know what the disciples thought because that's where his ministry focus was at this time with his disciples. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. Now this was a big deal. You know, everyone get this in your mind. This is a big deal because the phrase the Christ of God was loaded with meaning. Anyone know what the Hebrew word for Christ is? Have we used it today? Might have. Starts with M. Messiah. That's right, yeah. Yep. So it's the Hebrew word Messiah, Mashiach. So Peter was saying that all the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah applied to this man Jesus who was standing right there with them, you know. So it's not a conclusion that a person could come to by their own logic. Believe it or not. You can see he's an amazing miracle worker. He does amazing things. He says, teaches amazing, cool things. But unless you've got the Spirit, you can't see that. And I'm going to show you where that comes from. That comes from the Matthew version of this account. So Matthew 16, 17. I'll put it up on the, on the screen so you can turn it up to you. But Matthew 16, 17 expands on what just happened there. 
And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. That's Simon is Peter's other name. And Bar-Jonah just means son of Jonah, so Jonah was his dad. So blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Okay, so it's a big deal that he's got to this point where he can say that. And it means for all of us, even today, no one can confess Jesus as Lord, honestly, in their hearts, and come to him in faith by their own wisdom or cleverness, just by figuring it out. <coughs> so even in the case for Christ we saw, last, those of us who saw it last week, there was the intellectual part, but that was just getting him to the place where he had to surrender. And ultimately it was the Holy Spirit who showed him that. That it, that it was love. In the end. So God must draw us. And God must draw everyone. And enable them by his Holy Spirit. So it's actually a weight off our shoulders, if you think about it. Because for us, of it, those of us who do know Christ, it's not our job to convert people. Let me explain that. Our job is to live and speak the authentic gospel to people, fearlessly and faithfully. And remember, it's God's Holy Spirit that does like the heavy lifting, the hard work of converting people. Does that sort of make sense? That we're not trying to badger everyone to get saved. We do as best we can to tell them, but it's God's job to save them. <coughs> and in doing that, we will be more likely to get the balance right between building up the church on one hand, you know, family of believers, and then outreach on the other. Because you've you got to have both, but you've got to get that balance right. Because I would argue there's some churches who are too insular, worried only about themselves and their own comfort, even more than their own spiritual, um, even more than their own spiritual growth, growth, which of course is wrong, to be too insular. But there are other churches, and there are actually way more of these kind these days it seems that put all their resources into t- reaching seekers, but in the meantime starve their own fellowships of the richness of the gospel. So there's the, the, the two extremes there, and you get both in various places. So, but if you're putting all your effort in just seekers, and not building the church, it's like you know, spraying water on the leaves of a tree or a bush, but never watering or fertilising the tree itself. You really you need to build that centre. So, what happens then is you can see this everywhere spiritually that the tree withers if you're just spraying the leaves. The tree withers. And then the leaves have nothing to attach to anyway, so everything is lost. So we really need to get that balance right. Remembering that salvation is, God's job is a key part of that, I think, because it keeps our focus on the right thing. Jesus and the gospel, rather than what some seekers want this particular week, because that changes like week to week, what people like, what's fatty or whatever. Sorry, it's fatty with D's, not T, so fatty. In fact, it's interesting what Jesus says next in light of this evangelism issue. So we look back now at Luke 9.21. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So we, we often see when Jesus' identity is attested in some way, he wants them to keep it quiet. You see that quite a lot, haven't we? In, in, through Luke. Um, and this time, though, he gives some of the reason. If you look at what we just read, look at that verse. It's to do with his death and resurrection. Because there was a schedule Jesus had to keep. And if, if reports that he was the Messiah started to get some traction, amongst other rumours of him being John the Baptist or Elijah or whatever, then it might speed things up too much. So it's interesting that Jesus did first ask what other people were saying and get a gauge about what people are thinking about who he is. As long as they stuck to those other ideas, he wouldn't be putting himself in the frame for crucifixion just yet. That sort of makes some sense. But it's also interesting that this is the first time, at least in Luke, that Jesus mentioned that he's going to be crucified. Now this would have been just way outside in the expectations of the, of the disciples, which is probably why they couldn't accept it. Because, for example, when Peter stated that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, that brought it all these, with it all these expectations of this you know, conquering the Romans and establishing the messianic rule over everything, 
That's what was in their heads. This, Jesus is the guy who's going to do that. And he's going to do it soon. That's what they're thinking. Because that's what the Old Testament said. But what they overlooked was that this man was also destined to die. And the, the classic passage of that is Isaiah 53, where it gives even the reason why he had to die. So Isaiah 53, just choose verse 5 and just look at that, because it gives us the reason why he had to die. Verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. He was for us, he died in our place. And this was in the Old Testament. They, they read that, they knew that was in there. But as humans, don't we all choose to, to focus on the bits that we want to remember, don't we? Like the victory and the happiness and the, all the celebration bits. Because, and I mean, we're all like that. So we must be always very careful when we look at prophecies for our future today, from, from now into our future. There are things that we know for certain, but there are many things that we need to wait and see on. Because we're all so easily distorted by our own wants. What we want to happen is one thing, but God has his own program. And I think this is what the disciples were doing. They were just cherry-picking the prophecies that said all the good stuff. And didn't look at the one about death. The one's about death, there are several. Now that's no call for us today to avoid prophecy. Paul warns us against that in 1 Thessalonians 5.20. He says, don't um, ignore prophecies. But we need to carry the appropriate amount of caution when we do look at them. Not due to any problem with God's word, but due to our misplaced desires very often. We see things as we want to see them. Do do you agree with that? Very often we look with our own eyes that we want to see. So I say that to just give you some context as to why the disciples would have been quite shocked to hear Jesus talking like this about dying. They might have said, Jesus, you just just confirmed you're the Messiah just then, but straight away you tell us you're going to die. Don't be crazy, Jesus. In fact, back in the Matthew account, we see Peter actually telling Jesus off or suggesting it. This is at this at this point. It wasn't written in Luke, but this is in Matthew. But what does Jesus tell him? If you remember that passage, what, what does Jesus tell Peter when he corrects him? Get behind me, Satan. When he tells him that, that's, that's quite a rebuke. Can you imagine Jesus telling you that? But it does show us who's really behind anything that seeks to challenge God's plan. And Satan can use any weakness in us to exploit that, as he did here with Peter in Matthew. So in response to this rebuke by Peter, Jesus needs to show them what it really means to get in line with God's program. So what does it look like for us to do God's will? That's what he's saying. So, so here it is from Jesus' own mouth. What does it look like? Verse 23. And he said to all, that's those disciples there, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. So now we're tempted to say follow several times. Aren't we? But that's right. The song is a little catchy. But it's good that he said that several times, because to me that's actually the, the key word in here that we want to point out now anyway is the idea of following. We don't try and tell Jesus what to do, like Peter did when he rebuked him. He's God, remember? We listen and follow behind him. So Jesus goes first and we follow him. Keeping to his footsteps as best we can, with the Holy Spirit enabling us to do that. But looking at the verse as a whole there, it first comes from desire. Okay? The, the translation here is, if anyone would come after me. So the idea of would there is, is actually the Greek word phileo, which is, means to want or to desire. So that's if you desire, if you want to follow Christ. So that's the free will that we all have. God's given us all free will. And we can use that for good or for evil. So if that's our desire then, if, if we actually genuinely want to follow Christ, then once we're in Christ... Um, keeping in mind this he's talking to saved people here even though he just told Peter get behind me Satan, that didn't mean he's not saved um, because this is, is an instruction to the already converted Okay, this, this verse it's not for those who aren't um, converted because they're not going to want to follow Christ but if you are and you want to, you want to follow Christ this is how we are to live our lives once Jesus has brought us into his family 
So once we're in Christ, we are to deny ourselves. And we deny ourselves to get into Christ as well, but this is talking about daily living. So this is the second phase of our salvation, you know, the sanctification, where we grow and deny ourselves. This is part of it. So to deny ourselves, that is our hopes and passions in the natural, uh, we, to turn away from those things. We have to allow God to give us new hopes and passions, ones that are in line with his plan and for us as his children. Remember, we're children of God, so that's the whole dynamic there we've got to keep in mind. But not just children, we're also heirs of the kingdom of God. Think about that, you're an heir of the kingdom of God. That's kind of amazing. So the desires for worldly things are just way too insignificant for us as God's children. For just this earth. I'm not saying we ignore this earth, but you know, we need to have some bigger, bigger picture things going on. So we have to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily. So daily. So here's what it, that would mean to a first century Jewish people. We've got a quote here from Leon Morris from the... the uh, Um, a reference I was using he said this the disciples knew so speaking of the idea of carrying a cross when a man from one of their villages took up took up a cross and went off with a little band of Roman soldiers we see that fairly regularly he was on a one way journey he'd not be back taking up the cross meant the utmost in self denial Jesus never cuts back on the on the Intensity of what he says is is serious. And Jesus says we're to do this daily. And this kind of tends to tie it in with the idea of daily bread when you hear this daily idea. And hope, which is hopefully our daily time with God. For each of us, we should try and have a daily time with God. So one suggestion is that we should consciously and deliberately say to God every day, yes, I'm willing to give up my desires to follow you. Maybe that's one way that you can apply that verse about taking up the cross. Well, not that verse, but verse 23. You consciously do it. You say, this is a new day. I'm going to follow you and follow your desires the best I can. Now that's a really hard thing to say, isn't it? And mean. Because we all have these desires for a lot of things. And we're so used to getting what we want in our culture... Instant phones, instant messages, fast travel, compared to walking on foot anyway. Um, you can go and buy food wherever you want, whenever you want. Most of us you know, just go down the shop and everything's in there. We are very spoiled, if you're honest. But maybe that's exactly it. We've been spoiled of our appreciation for God's generosity to us. And it makes all this God stuff a bit foreign to so many. Because we're all comfy, aren't we? That's why it's hard to get people to follow Christ. Because why do I need God? I'm, I've got everything I need. Touch of a button, <coughs> fingertips. And that's why we need to be reminded in verse 24. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So that good life I just described, which so many people will have, that many of us still have, for now anyway... Who knows what the future holds? It's at least one of the kinds of life I think Jesus is referring to here. The the lazy, I've got everything, I don't need to worry kind of life. But if we spend all our efforts to get stuff, you know, all the bits and pieces, which we need some of that stuff, but if we get more than we need, to maintain our standard of living at at whatever expense, no matter what, go into great debt because I've got to maintain what I've got, to keep up with the Joneses or whatever. Uh, if we're consumed with that life, then we, we may get everything we dream of. It may happen. But what about after that? It's that eternal perspective that is behind what Jesus says next in verse 25. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? So basically, to put it in the language of today, you can't take it with you. We've all heard that phrase somewhere. You can't take it with you. Because eternity is a very, 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 very long time. It's not even time. It's, you know, eternity is eternity. And what we live now is a very, very short time. So get that balance right. So we need to always have that eternal perspective. That one day we'll stand before the King Jesus. 
And we're about to see what he's the king, don't forget. And the only things, well, only the things we've done of eternal value will count on that day. So how are you going to go on that day? We need to ask ourselves that question. That's, it's a very real question, because it's a very real situation that will happen to all of us. It's going to happen. Are you ready? You could gain the whole world. But what good is it in the end if you're in fire? And the prime example of that is Satan himself. He will gain the whole world before Jesus' second coming. But his destiny is the lake of fire. Now, I'm glad about that. But don't we want to spare everyone else from going down the same road with him? Yeah? So we need to be bold with carrying the name of Jesus with us wherever we go. So in verse 26. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of his of the holy angels. Okay, so that's day's coming. So don't forget. But then he says something quite cryptic, verse 27. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now what does that mean? Now a lot of people have a lot of different views. Some say it means that they would see Jesus' resurrection. I would say, okay, but they all saw that. They all saw the resurrection, resurrected Christ. Not some. So I don't believe that's it. Some say it means the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Another 40 odd years down the track. Well, that would mean some, because some would have died in the meantime. But, um, in fact, most of them probably died before that. But I personally can't see that quite as the coming of the kingdom of God. Sure, the example being the tribulation period still to come, God will use bad people to bring about his kingdom on earth, and not just then, but all the time he does that. But scripture and history give us nothing to say that that's God's kingdom coming in 70 AD. I don't think that's really it either. And the other main view, which is the one I hold, says to basically just read on in the passage. That's quite a simple one. Read on. What What happens next? In fact, every account of Jesus saying this in the Gospels is followed by the description of the transfiguration of Jesus. Only three of the disciples were there to see it. That takes care of the sum. And it certainly qualifies as seeing the kingdom of God. So it all makes sense to me, biblically and logically. So that's why I hold that view. So let's see how Luke records it. Verse 28. Now about eight, about eight days after these things... So after these sayings, he took with him Peter, John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. Now there's lots of scholarly debate about which mountain they were on. But there are two main front runners, Mount Hermon and Mount Tabor. Now I'll just show you. I'm going to go in somewhere with this, so go with me. So this is the zoomed in map of the one I showed before. Actually no, it's zoomed out, isn't it? Zoomed out map. And somebody, but not me, has circled uh, Caesarea Philippi. That was helpful because that's where they are, roughly in that vicinity of this, where this passage happens. And you can see Mount Tabor is down here. Let me point it out. Mount Tabor is there. That's Mount Tabor. And Mount Hermon is up there. That's Mount Hermon, the peak of it there anyway. It's, the whole thing's like part of the mountain. Now they could certainly reach Mount Tabor there in a week or so, so it's not beyond the realms of possibility that the transfiguration happened down there in Mount Hermon, or Mount Tabor. But you can see that Mount Hermon is much closer to where they were at the time. And it's interesting that Luke simply says they went to the mountain. Like it was the known one considering their location, which is another reason to the, would point me towards Mount Hermon, I think. I'm just trying to logically think this through. Now, most of you are probably saying, so what, who cares which mountain it was on, Uh, just get on with it. But I think there's another reason to suspect Mount Hermon. It has to do with history and legends surrounding that mountain. Now, this is something that not many people talk about, but um, I'm finding this kind of stuff is getting more and more relevant to um, to what we see around us and what understanding the Bible. So let me explain. I mentioned a little while ago, for those who are here, about how the opening verses of Genesis 6 describe the rise of these beings called the Nephilim. The Nephilim means fallen ones. Uh, Which would seem to be the main reason for Noah's flood, to wipe these types out. A bit more spiritual warfare going on. 
Well, there are several ancient texts, not the Bible, which describe Mount Hermon as the place which all these shenanigans happened. Okay, of the uh, Nephilim and all that stuff. So it's a place where the fallen angels descended from heaven. Now that may or may not be the case, but certainly many believed that in the day of Jesus. That was the prevailing view about Mount Hermon. So another reason I suspect the transfiguration happened on Mount Hermon is because this could be Jesus making a statement to the spirit world. As much as to Peter, John and James, and he was saying to them, making the announcement, I'm the boss. This, is, this spot here is a significant spot, but I'm making a statement here. So perhaps that's something to consider as we go through this amazing event. I'll, it'll, I'll explain a little bit more as we go. Verse 29. As he was praying, Jesus, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, this is a wow moment if ever there was one. If you can imagine trying to be there. But, as we're about to see, the disciples were asleep. Somehow. For some reason. But we'll get to that in a minute too. But before we do, there's a couple of points I just want to make. First is that Jesus is taking the veil away, in a sense. If you want to use that kind of wording. It's just a little snippet of Jesus as he really is. This isn't him in his full glory. It's still a little veiled, but it is who he really is. So when he was walking the earth, he veiled his glory at all times but this, pretty much. In this kind of way, anyway. In the shining of his true self. So this is a special moment. So that's um, this, so this is seeing the kingdom of God, as verse 27 describes it. Uh, what is part of the kingdom of God? Well, you can say who? Believers are part of the kingdom of God, aren't we? We're part of the kingdom of God. So we see two of the more famous believers from history. So Moses and Elijah. And they're having a meeting with Jesus. Now, some ask, were they really Moses and Elijah? Well, to them, I'd say, what does the Bible say? It says Moses and Elijah, doesn't it? Not, not in the likeness of Moses and Elijah, as if they were apparitions or something. Uh, so this is appearance, I would argue, um, of the glorified states of two Old Testament prophets. That's who they were. And they came to chat with Jesus about his departure. So the word is, is Exodus, actually, in the Greek. So what departure are they talking about? His death, is it, or his ascension, or uh, what, what, what was it? What kind of departure was it? There are several theories, but I think the, th- the one that makes the most sense is his death. Because that is his great accomplishment, right? His death is his great accomplishment, because it talks about being an accomplishment to accomplish in Jerusalem. If the word is literally fulfill, which his death certainly was a fulfilment, we saw in um, Isaiah 53, didn't we? He fulfilled it. More than his ascension specifically, his ascension isn't specifically predicted in the same kind of way. Obviously it's naturally expected, but... And that certainly happened in Jerusalem, his death. And where did Jesus depart to? Anyone know where Jesus went when he died? He went in the grave, obviously, but... Well, Peter actually tells us. Interestingly, Peter was here at the occasion. 1 Peter 3, 18 to 20. So if you're following along, you can go there. 1 Peter chapter 3, this is 18 to 20. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. Now, this language seems to be deliberately related to the whole Nephilim thing I just mentioned before, with reference to the flood and all that, because remember that's a lot of the reason for the flood was to get rid of these guys. And the spirits probably being those bad angels who came down on Mount Hermon in the first place. Now, I hope this isn't freaking you out too much. I know it's not often talked about, but my point for talking about all this stuff is this. Ready? If they were on Mount Hermon at the time, because it's not definite they were, but 
seems possible and quite likely. That would be the ideal time to make the statement to the principalities and powers that the real king is here. It's Jesus. And he began the job of rolling back the devil's work from the same place that it started. Well, he started in the garden, didn't he? But, you know, that particular part of it. And he's doing it in person. He's standing there. Now, even today, he's got a lot of work to do. Jesus, yes. <laughs> but he's doing a lot of it through us. But it was his death on the cross that struck the death blow to Satan and his plans. So from that day on, he's been fighting as a defeated enemy. Satan has. This is without doubt the most obvious Jesus ever made his shining glory for natural eyes. In saying that, I no way diminish his work on the cross, which was shining glory to spiritual eyes. But um, his transfiguration was a different kind of thing. So here he was on the mountain for all to see. Well, kind of all to see. Three, three guys anyway. And they were asleep. As we see, verse 32. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and two men who stood with him. I always think that's Jesus' way, isn't it? He's never one for showing off. And so he shows himself to three men when they're asleep in his glory. But anyway, they wake up and they see it. So our Lord is humble, put it that way. But we can confirm that Jesus, or that prophecy Jesus made in verse 27 now, it was fulfilled, wasn't it? That they saw those guys, some of them will see his glory. So they did. Now verse 33. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, uh, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Don't you, do you love Peter? He, um, this just shows us a bit more what Peter's like. Um, as I put it on the top there, loud mouth Peter. Now, he didn't know what to say, but he just said something anyway. So I think it's funny. Now, some scholars say that this mention of tents or little shelters, or booths even, tells us there was time near the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, you're not sure about that, but, so, but if it was, that might mean what Peter said is not quite as random as we might think. But we don't really know. But in any case, we see here, and in many places, that Peter is someone who's impulsive and loud. As some say he's a ready, fire, aim kind of guy. If you think about that. Ready, fire, aim. Now, we all know someone like that. Uh, in fact, my dad was a bit like this. <laughs> Lewis, yes? Me too. Oh, you as well? Yeah. Are you claiming that? I'm not saying that. <laughs> no, but I know no, he was, yes. my dad was like that. Yes. yes. He would, if he didn't know what to say, he'd say something anyway. But if you look after the resurrection... He gave, this is Peter, he gave one of the most eloquent speeches in the Bible at Pentecost. So the lesson for all of us then is don't stress about your inadequacies, or at least what you think are inadequacies. God made you exactly the way you are for a reason. And when the time comes, as we talked about last week, he will provide exactly what you need. He will provide in your character, whatever. In Peter's case, he provided eloquence, and perhaps for you it will be courage or, or insight or whatever, but whatever you need at the time, he will provide it. But how do we know that he will provide? Because as we've just seen, he's the almighty son of God. right? And we're about to see his father give a verbal witness to that. Verse 34. As he was saying these things, so Peter, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they'd seen. So again, we see they tell no one again. That's that's what they often do. At least in in those days. That phrase is important there. Because they kept silent and told no one in those days. But obviously after his resurrection, they certainly did tell people everything. That shows us the reason why he wanted to keep silent, right? Up to the cross to keep everything on schedule. So, all right, so we've covered a fair bit of ground today. So let's just recap. Jesus decided it was time, so this is the story of this message, of this passage. Jesus decided it was time to see if the message had gotten through to his followers about his identity. Right? And because of that, we get that great statement from Peter about Jesus being the Messiah. 
the one sent from God to save us from our sins. So that's one thing we can take home from this, isn't it? We've confirmed again that the salvation is through this man Jesus and him alone. And that's really the fundamental thing. Peter and the disciples finally got to that point by living with Jesus and seeing everything he did because they'd been with Jesus for that time, over a year, I think. We see it today by believing their testimony written in the Bible and the Holy Spirit works both those ways through, through his communication to us through the Bible and by seeing these stories. <coughs> and then once Jesus had that response from Peter, he took just him and John and James up what I suspect was a very strategic mountain for the reasons I've described and showed just a glimpse of his true glory. And if that wasn't enough, God the Father himself spoke again, as he did at Jesus' baptism, if you recall, but the baptism of Jesus, I mean, the Father spoke again at both those times to give affirmation of his Son, who he is. And what was the instruction that came with it? What, what God the Father said? What did he say? It was an instruction. Listen. Listen to him. That's right. So we can couple that then with what Jesus' own instructions are further back in the passage, which was to deny yourself and follow him. So as a lesson for us, we can put these things together and put them and say this, listen to him. So the first part is to listen to him, that is in reading his word and prayer and meeting together and that kind of thing. Listen to God speaking to you. Deny yourself. So let his desires and priorities become your desires and priorities and follow him. So that's, remember it's a relationship. So you're following his footsteps, not just his instructions. You get that difference. Not just trying to follow the rules of Jesus. We're following a person. We're following what he did and what he's doing. So he's been there first. He's cleared the way. So we're following behind him relationally. So let's take this challenge of Jesus and God the Father seriously. Listen to him. Deny yourself and follow him. So let's pray. Father, thank you that you sent your son to show us the way. To be the way. Lord, we thank you that you made a way for us to relate to him by his his death on the cross for us. And Lord, thank you that you are rolling back the work of the devil. Help us to be a part of that, Lord. May we follow you and listen to your instructions as, as you tell us what to do in this world and help us to be faithful and loving with you and with each other especially. So thank you for this message today. Please change us in Jesus' name. Amen.